All right, so let's go ahead and get started. <laughs> so uh, my name is Alyssa. I'm Jose. And we're going to be talking about a couple of the books that we've read in Living Writers at SDSU. We're going to start with We Were Here by Matt De La Pena. Shout out Matt De La Pena. <laughs> so we wanted to start with this book because we actually have worked with Matt De La Pena a lot at SDSU and we've been lucky enough to take lots of his classes. So we wanted to talk about some of his teaching styles and how that kind of manifests in his book. Yeah, so um, being able to work with Matt De La Pena has been a lot of fun as we get to focus on, he, it feels like he has a focus of identity, community and culture. And I think on display and we were here is a lot of identity, but also a culture that is kind of overlooked upon even to today of uh, kids who are, aren't really given second chances. And I think that's where we are here excels. And for me personally, um, being able to, you know, work with Matt Dela Pena and have him tell me that there's stories out there that aren't like conventional, but still need to be told such as we were here. It's such an eye opener because, you know, he wrote this book in 2009 and you can say it really opened up a discussion about um, mental health in young boys. Um, and what like recovery could look like from consequences and behavior issues and stuff like that. And like fast forward to 2022, when I myself am looking at how to write things, I'm able to go back in time and work with the professor, but also work with a book that opens doors for a lot of different people. And I think going off the idea of sort of basically men's mental health, because I definitely think that that's something that back in 2009, if I'm correct, when this was published, it definitely wasn't addressed as much. And I think even now it's not really in the media as much as it should be. And so this book really, since it's in the form of a diary, I don't know why I opened the book, but since it's in the form of a diary, uh, it definitely, it stays in the mind of the main character. And because the main character does start off with that sort of toxic masculinity, we see that kind of deconstruct itself as we get through because it's hard to maintain that toxic masculinity when you have to be retrospective and introspective and think about how you're feeling, why you're feeling that. And so I think that the form of the uh, journal or the diary is actually really fascinating because it just forces that, um, it forces men's mental health to be at the forefront of the novel. And I, like I said, I don't think that that's shown enough. Yeah, um, and obviously, like now looking at it from 2022, I can respect where Matt Delapena was operating from. Um, being able to uh, be a student of his, I was able to, you know, write a similar story, share it with him, and then you know compare notes on where we're approaching uh, men's mental health from. And you know, for him, it was a direct experience um, of him working with kids and. For me, it was more of a direct experience of what I went through as a young Latino growing up in San Diego. So, you know, looking back at 2009, I'm reading We Were Here, I'm just like, wow, this is really good for 2009. Because now that I'm in 2022, I'm also thinking of like, this is what I would have done better. This is, you know, I would have wanted to provide more resources to kids. And it's, it's interesting to look at it with that lens of like, in, you know, I'm directly working with this professor, this writer, who opened up those doors, but didn't, I feel like didn't go all the way through. And like, as you were saying, Alyssa, it's because, you know, men's mental health wasn't a big issue then. But now looking at 2022 as writers, it's kind of like, well, how can we push this further? How can we make this conversation be more prevalent? And I think going off that, one of the things that I was most surprised about when I was reading this novel is spoiler alert, the scene where Mong dies by suicide, where he goes into the ocean, and even though it's not necessarily, the word suicide really isn't used in the book, as per my knowledge, I, it's just, you don't necessarily see that at all, even now, and so I think 
there are definitely aspects of the book, um, like portrayal of women, which we can get into later if we want to. But I think that there are some things in the book that aren't don't go far enough. But I definitely think that that is one of the things, the depiction of suicide. I think that that is one. It's it's hard to do that without it becoming sensationalized and more about the graphicness of it or the violence of it instead of just like what that means that the person is going through mentally in order for that to happen. So I think that that was something that was really well done and it was approached in a really positive or really useful and efficient way because like I said the entire book is about men's mental health and yet it really never uses those words it approaches it in different ways like a journal to deconstruct the masculinity and then Monk, who is this character who we always think of as very aggressive and maybe doesn't have a lot of emotion shown. And so when we get to that point, we realize just how deeply depressed he was and how unhappy he was. And that wasn't necessarily shown earlier on. So I think that that's a good message to young people to say, like, this is this is one way that a suicidal person can look. Yeah, I also think, um, you know, working with De La Pena I, and writing the stories that we do at like a border campus at SDSU, there's a lot of emphasis on culture. Um, and I think the brilliance that's on display and we were here is that culture is involved and we're kind of um, playing with the stereotypical norms um, involved with almost uh, each each race that is included in this piece, in this book. And I think um, it's, it's, a, it's an interesting way to look at um, what young men can go through and how I think the best part about it was showing these people who have made mistakes, who are considered to be on like the wrong side of life at that moment and like showing the beginning of like a healing process and them being given like a second chance third chance to be able to like actually enjoy life or have a life and I think you know being like showing that is something that not a lot of authors would do but also just like in general society kind of in my opinion, shuns upon. We, we don't really, we say they're second chances, but how often do we actually see them being given? Yeah, and I think to that, I have two thoughts. So the first one is that I, I definitely think that the book does a good job of deconstructing and explaining the racism behind the fact that Rondell always calls Miguel Mexico. And we had that scene where he, where Miguel walks him through like, why this is racist? But I don't think that we really see the stereotypes placed on to Rondell and Mong deconstructed as much. We have Rondell, who is essentially a very religious, large, fat Black man who is really good at basketball. And the fact that he he's like over and over and over, we see that he doesn't really read anything but the Bible. And the joke is that he actually cannot read. And that he's just kind of looking at the Bible without reading it. And so I think that, like I said, there are certain things that this novel does really well. And I think it really focuses on the Mexican identity and men's mental health. But I don't think that it really delves into other stereotypes that it deals with. It just sort of glosses over that to focus on other things. And I personally have never been able to do anything like this. So I can't speak to whether or not I think that it could be done better. But I do think, like you were saying, Jose, now looking at it in 2022, obviously you have a different lens going into it. And the other thing I was going to mention is, oh, now I'm blinking. <laughs> I was going to mention, oh, the ending, the ending, because I think that you were just talking about second chances. And, you know, Matt DeLapena always says he doesn't like happy endings. He likes hopeful endings. And I think that this book is the embodiment of that. Because spoiler alert again, um, <laughs> it ends with Miguel not necessarily, he doesn't 
<laughs> everything isn't magically fixed, right? And nothing, it's not an easy, complete, this is, everyone is happy, you know, rainbows and sprinkles. It's actually, it's a lot more um, realistic in the fact that, yes, Miguel has screwed up a lot in his life. I mean, he's done some pretty awful things intentionally and non-intentionally. And that doesn't just go away because, you know, he's gone through more struggles and he's learned about himself and he's come of age. Now he has to kind of work through those consequences, accept them, and lead to a hopeful ending. Yeah, so wanting to segue, <laughs> um, the, the beauty of being able, you know, to work at, with Matt De La Pena at SDSU and then also have diverse um, writers, living writers, if you will, um, come talk to us is we get different tastes of what we talk about in class of like um, culture. And I think, you know, um, Matt De La Pena is from National City and a lot of his stuff is from the West Coast. And then he went to Brooklyn, but then came back. And I think the beauty of um, this semester for me was being able to look at Chris Barron, who's also from SDSU's The Magical Imperfect, and Elizabeth Velasquez is When We Make It. Um, and The Magical Imperfect uh, handles like an immigrant community in San Francisco, while When We Make It covers um, the Latin community in New York. And I think it's, it's an interesting for me as a young Latino male to read about New York because I usually solidify my Latin experience to what's here on the West Coast and how that differs, you know, being right next to a border with San Isidro and Chula Vista and all that stuff and everything that comes with that. But then like, there's also a completely different experience happening in, um, in New York. And I think being able to like experience those narratives while we talk about capturing culture and community is really enlightening and also, you know, telling us as writers that we have to broaden our horizons a little bit, that not one narrative is going to be um, the main narrative. There's so many different types of stories going on all around the world, and we should read about them. So I think we can start with San Francisco and the Magical Imperfect, and a little made-up community, but it's still an immigrant community, and how um, Chris Barron captures this, like, culture, this immigrant culture of like, we got to stick together and all this stuff. But after generations, they kind of, it kind of breaks down and you see like a division and how people start coming at each other. But then when an earthquake happens, the, com the immigrant community like comes back together. And I think um, being able to see that, but also being able to see it through a different cultural lens um, was pretty, I don't know, eye-opening in a way of like, I would never be able to see it the way Chris Barron was able to envision it, especially with influences from immigrating in the Pacific, but also the religious aspects of being Jewish. Yeah, and for me, um, this novel is actually the first inverse novel I'd ever read because I always felt that they were too inaccessible for me as a prose writer. And so when I read it, I was, I was so enthralled by the fact that it still maintains a narrative and a plot, despite the fact that, as you can see, the pages are relatively sparse and there's a lot of white space, which I think is really fascinating. We will get more into when we talk about Velasquez's novel. But what really resonated with me in this novel is the focus on mental health once again. And we, we have the mother who essentially she's going, from what we can understand, she, she essentially is depressed and she has to be removed from her family so that she can get better. And the son, he struggles, he loses his ability to speak because he doesn't really want to say anything if it's not talking to his mother. I mean, this trauma of losing his mother to a facility that he really doesn't always understand. In fact, on page five, he describes this experience as saying that his, mo his mother says that the roads her thoughts take are too windy for now and she needs help straightening them out. So in other words, 
I guess I just overall I just love the way that Chris Barron uses poetry to explain a mental health struggle, especially from the perspective of a child who doesn't always probably understand what's going on. And I think that that really blends well with this idea of the immigrant struggle because this later on we see the idea of healing brought into the book in a sort of magical way with the clay that also brings in Malia who uses the, the clay to try and get rid of her eczema. So I think that the theme of healing is really important in all three novels that we're talking about today. Now we were talking about um, young males mental health um, and I, I would want to ask you, Alyssa, who do you, what do you think um, was more beneficial or who do you think handled it better? Or like what form lends itself better to um, young men's mental health? Do you think the epistolary worked better with We Were Here? Or did you like the way the inverse worked to capture um, the magical and perfect prototype? I think that, I would say that with a caveat, I think that We Were Here did a better job because of the fact that the journal form is just so much better at getting into the mind of the person. I think the magical and perfect is just so poetic at times that it can be, I think poetry can sometimes, this coming from a prose writer, of course, can sometimes be a little bit constraining because you want your words to sound, to sound good as just opposed to having the meaning that you want to convey. And so, I think that the journal form does it more justice because you can see in the beginning, I definitely many times had the thought that this main character is deplorable. <laughs> and I really was waiting for the moment when we had that big turnaround, which I will honestly say I did not really get that catharsis at the end. I definitely saw a progression, but it wasn't necessarily the type of cathartic progression that I was hoping for, meaning at the end, I really wanted to see that toxic masculinity just completely thrown out the window and that wasn't really the case. But I do still think that this did a better job because in this novel, what we really see is um, the main character is just trying to figure out his own, he's trying to unpack his own trauma, but he doesn't really even know it's trauma because this is also a younger character than we're dealing with in Magdal Pena's book. What do you think? Um, similar to you, I feel like the epistolary, wow, I could not say that, the epistolary, um, lends itself a tiny bit better to, um, breaking down the mental health aspect and let us really be with the character and their thought process. Um, I think that's where I was really pulled in with Miguel because I felt like I mean, the, the, the word, the language is a little dated, but I felt like I was there in the head of Miguel and I could, every, every sentence I could follow as a thought process. But I think the beauty of being the magical and perfect is um, we can see more emotion with uh, the inverse aspect and it lended itself to really make me feel alongside this young character. And it almost put me in the same headspace. And it's not following the thought process, it's just following the words and really feeling them and being able to not only connect that to my own experiences, but just about what would I do in those situations and like with this feeling that I'm feeling from just reading the words. Yeah, I do agree that I think that the Magical and Perfect, <coughs> I'm sorry, allowed for more of a, an emotional read because, I mean, the phrase, the lines that I just read are probably my favorite lines in the entire novel because they are talking about, I mean, they explain mental illness in a way that only a kid could really say it. And I think that while prose novels obviously exist in, in, the genre of YA, I think that the inverse form really lends itself to the way that um, young adults, children, middle grade, the, the way they think, because you can sort of, you understand what they're trying to say, even if it's not spelled out for you like it is in this novel. 
so speaking of inverse, the other inverse novel that we read was When We Make It. And I want to say from the very beginning, I like was tearing up um, just from like the uh, like the introduction. So like we're waiting for your stories. I, I was just like, wow, that's amazing. Um, and I think, you know, being able to see a, a culture um, captured by Elizabeth Velasquez um, was just amazing and I think it's probably one of the it's probably going in one of my top five books um but the way that she covers community culture the way we the way that this community bands together but is also against each other and just everything about that is so intricate yet complex and it feels like it's all very well balanced and it's also um, compared to the other two from a female perspective. And it's being able to look at, in a sense, my own culture, but from a different gender is, um, it's interesting because I, you know, once again, like I could never be able to experience the way they live, but here are words that let me know of like, oh, like I see the same thing, just very different. Yeah. And I think to go along with the emotion, what I really loved about this novel is that um, Velasquez, she really plays with form so much. And I appreciate that because like, for instance, we have um, on page 170, she has a poem called, I'm gonna butcher this, Un Verano in Nueva New York. And, um, <laughs> And it's basically one long paragraph. I mean, you can't really tell because my background is blurring it for you, but it's one long paragraph. And there is, yeah, there, there's no punctuation except for things that don't stop the sentence. So I, and I just, I really appreciate that. And then also we have on page 184, if the news articles, if the news article was about police brutality and you can see the black lines blocking out some of the phrases I think just overall, yes, thank you. I think just overall, I really appreciated how she plays with form to really bring alive her experience and telling the experience of people who whose voices are often not represented. And I I really think that the verse form, I I really appreciate that we have the two examples here, magical and perfect, and when we make it, because they they use the verse form in such different ways. I definitely think Velasquez is more of a poetic uh, writer and Baron is more of a narrative writer, but obviously they both have poetry and narrative in their novels. And so I just, I love to, I love to talk about her form. And so I'll take any opportunity, even if it's not really connected to what you just said. <laughs> um, I think just to kind of, take a little bit of a segue into something that might be productive. Um, another poem that I really appreciated, um, essentially this poem happens after trigger warning uh, and spoiler alert. Um, this poem on 279 is basically, it happens after the main character has been raped and it says, the title is, mommy thinks I'm still a virgin and then the, t the poem is just two lines and it reads, it only happened once, so maybe I think I still am too. And I think that poem just really demonstrates how well Velasquez balances the meaning of her poems and the form of her poems. She really makes sure that the form is pairing well with the content and that it only accentuates, emphasizes what is in her poem. So she never uses the form as a gimmick to get you interested. And I really, really appreciate that about her. And she also clearly deals with a lot of important topics in here from the immigrant experience to um, being a woman of color in a world that is not as made for white men. I mean, the list goes on. And I, I just can't say enough about her book. <laughs> Yeah, no, her book's great. And it also includes resources in the back for everything that um, is mentioned in the book. And I think 
that is beautiful because like, you know, I feel like books nowadays are, have this like misconception of being archaic and you know, you, it doesn't keep up with the times yet here we have an author who does and who's giving resources and giving experiences that I think um, are in a way saying that like books are forever books books can adapt with the times just as humans can because books are stories and humans tell stories um i think when i really look at when we make it and you know working with matt de la pena and being at sdsu i i see elizabeth velasquez as a, a level we're trying to reach of showing the identity that comes with being from a being having ancestry from a different country but being in, a, in the united states um but also how the community can sometimes cannibalize itself um but also you know as a layered thing like you you're dealing with like oh this community is going to be to itself and even if we are destroying ourselves it's still up to us to fix that and you elizabeth velasquez is able to deal with that but also show like the exterior forces at play of trying to tear families apart, of how people are looking in that community. And I think that's everything that we, we see in both We Were Here and The Magical and Perfect, but just on a bigger scale. Um, and I think when we make it is that like perfect little, um, like if you were to have a Venn diagram, it's like right in the middle, of like just hitting everything that can impact a community of color. And just what does it, what does it feel like to get out of that, to like take a step back and realize just how, I wanna say like fast paced and like busy this world is. And you know, when you take a step back and you realize just being alive, being in that area, itself is just making it and being able to tell that story and put that story out there for the world is making it and I think you know having worked with De La Pena now for um, a couple of years that's to me what we're working towards that's the goal of like being able to tell these stories for those people who are so busy going into this you know world that's not precisely made for them and being able to tell them like hey you're doing a good job like you're as long as you're living like you're doing a good job all right well I think we've talked for a long time so any last thoughts that you want to share um definitely support these authors and buy these books yes plug <laughs> when we make it <laughs> follow her on instagram she has a great instagram account um by matt de la pena's new picture book uh milo imagines the world we're not getting paid to advertise by the way um no nope. we'll need to talk, talk really about that conversation though um all right well thank you for watching if you've made it through however long this video is and i mean i who we think just, who are we just, thinking? Just Marshall. We're just, just Professor Marshall. <laughs> just Professor um, Marshall. Thank you, Professor Marshall, for allowing us <laughs> this space and opportunity to talk about books that we actually enjoyed. Yeah. Yes. And thank you, Professor Marshall. And just in general, I'm I'm glad that we were able to read such varying novels because I have now read two inverse novels that I really enjoyed. So I, in addition to the pistolary novel that I also enjoyed, which are all first. Liar. <laughs> all right. So thank you for watching and bye. Have a good day. See you soon. <laughs>